maintenance and then some, some maintenance, even if we get things heading in the right direction. Um, we need the town buying in to the program. Um, we know that there are a variety of opinions on um, actions that might be taken. Um, and as uh, I've learned, and I hope most of you have learned, um, while the mayor may change and the councils may change, and if each council has to reassess the temperature of the uh, you know, the will of others for, for, for concern that they might, uh, might uh, be going against the town's wishes. The, the, the tactic, and the, we, we fortunately have a way of assessing the town's uh, um, uh, feeling and, and, and view on uh, programs. And so, I strongly believe we need to do, to take and get the, 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 the town's info. And we do that by doing a town meeting. And as you know, town meetings uh, don't direct, don't create legislation, they don't, can't actually start anything, but they advise those of us who can, not me, although I execute it, but the council to take action. So um, I, I think the council agrees, and certainly I would do so anyway. We're going to have a special town meeting. To, uh, to consider the Woods Committee's proposals, or anybody else's proposals, to move forward with uh, uh, reforestation gear control. And that's what we're aiming up to. This is an information meeting. That meeting will be unable, be unable to cover the kind of material, that kind of material, coming up to speed on what the options are at a town meeting. We want, any, we, we want as few people to come in there and wing it with, uh, uh, and, and uh, as many people to be knowledgeable when they walk through the door. And this is a meeting we hope to help do that. I'm going to stop talking then. I hope everybody um, leaves this meeting. I, I know there's a questionnaire here, which is a great questionnaire, it looks like, uh, to start to get people to think about what, what they would uh, how, how they would proceed and what they feel about the uh, options. And um, I hope everybody here will talk to all of the neighbors who aren't here. Um, and uh, uh, at least uh, indicate that um, this is an important uh, uh, matter for the, for, for the, the town's future, our self-image, which involves the woods, and foliage, and uh, we're, we're going to uh, we're going to want people to um, think hard and um, about uh, how, <coughs> how how they want to uh, address the the problem that is very obvious. So thank you. Thank
plan, which is what we've been using kind of as our uh, go-to document to give us the framework to what we want to do. He included some information about deer, but as a forester, he wasn't going into the details about deer management, but he did acknowledge that deer were a problem that's pretty obvious to everybody with over browsing and we're no different than anywhere else. But he included some issues about deer and also what's leading to all these non-native invasive plants in our um, town. Um, again, our forest, forest stewardship plan is really a three-pronged approach. We are trying to prevent, or will be looking at ways to prevent the overbrowsing of our forest understory. If you walk through, which we did late this afternoon with uh, Jonathan to show him our east and west woods, you can just see right through the forest, especially this time of the year, just overbrowsing, um, especially during the, the vegetative part of the season as well. The deer are just eating as high as they can go. Uh, we also want to remove and control our non-native invasive plants that are choking out our native plants, and we've actually made some successes of that over the past two years already. And we also want to support reforestation by replanting, and we have been doing some of that in, in certain populated areas already. So the goal is to restore and sustain a natural and healthy forest ecosystem. Our forests are not healthy right now. They're, they're doing better as we try to work with them, but there's a long way to go. Um, a reminder also that one of the things that we succeeded in doing was that we deplanted the East Woods. Many of you probably remember way back in the beginning that section of the East Woods really actually had a plat. There was potentially in the early days to actually um, create residences there and to actually build housing. And the town council, we finally made a decision that said that's never going to happen. And so we went through the process of taking um, that flat out and we deplatted the East Woods. So now you see that it is the West Woods and the East Woods, and that's what's on the county maps now. Overbrowsing by deer, as I mentioned, is pretty obvious. You really need to look at it with that um, new sort of lens. And when you see, you know, 13 or 14 deer walking through, you know, the woods or the town or your backyard, and even just tonight, there's a whole bunch of really handsome looking bucks out there. You just saw them in the, in the dusky um, part of the day. But we have a lot of overbrowsing, and it's taken out the other story. I mean, there may be still grass out there, but that's because they don't eat still grass, okay? They don't like that stuff, it's not native. There's lots of examples of deer damage as well. Um, we've obviously got things that are being chewed. We've got rubbing, and you'll see a lot of that this time of the year, right, because it's into the rut season, so this is the time of year they're really rubbing their antlers and sharpening them up, and they're marking their territory. Again, a browse line issue, and yummy, yummy, chomp, chomp. Uh, the other things that we've seen, some of those uh, deer damage areas, we've been trying to actually do some replantings. This is actually an example here up in the Saybrook community. There was a section of actually encroachment by some of the property owners onto our property. And so as we tried to restore that boundary line, we planted some trees. This shows a holly that was planted in the early fall. It was beautiful, but within a couple of months, it was pretty much chewed down to just some, some stems. And so we went out and we actually created, you know, sort of a meshwork around it. We staked it out, and now the holly is actually coming back. So we got there in time. This is another um, example over in what we call the Nikos trees area. Uh, and so we planted some smaller, younger trees to try to fill in about 35 of them. But within that same year, the deer came along and literally just pulled some of the uh, protectors off and then killed about two-thirds of the trees that we had planted in there, which is really sad. And I'll turn it over to Joan. She can talk a bit more about these invasive plants that we're seeing. Some of these invasive plants have been uh, in the country since 1850. But as deer problems started to develop over the last 20, 30 years, um, the non-native invasives have had an advantage over the native plants. And um, deer don't like the, the new plants. They're, they've evolved with the native plants, and so they chew the native plants as soon as they appear, and the non-natives take control. And um, some of the plants here are bush honeysuckle. This is the wavy leaf basket grass that we were attacking this past summer. This is English ivy, and here people have cut a window to try to control the English ivy. This is the um, myelin plant, and this one you can see the fruit. So this is late July, early August, and this is still grass. Um, this is wisteria, and the wisteria infestation in these woods has really gotten 
got me involved in non-native plant control. This was taken along Macaulay Street, and the wisteria has grown right up into the canopy, and the weight of it is take, was taking down trees. Here you can see the trees have lost their leaves, but look at all the wisteria that's still visible. So um, as a result of the suggestions on the Bill Bond uh, Forest Preservation, we put out an RFP to control non-native invasive plants, and there was a, a new company in Nashville, a national company, um, that was founded by people who were environmentally sensitive, and they were one of the ones that bid and actually got the contract. The, the town council voted unanimously to let them go in, and they had a plan to control non-native uh, invasive plants. And this is uh, some of the data that we get from them from the web website. These are some of the areas up near Macaulay and uh, Grove where the, the wisteria infestation was the worst. Um, we actually, before we took people through, we required a walkthrough before anybody could respond to the RFP. And we had, uh, with Charlie Charleston, we had mapped the woods with a grid. And we went through and we described there was a lot of a low lying wisteria here. Wisteria was really invasive here. Each of the quadrants we described what non native invasive plants were, the threat in that each of those quadrants. And then after the, um, the cut and uh, paint with the wisteria, Jay Everhart uh, developed a plan to see how effective it had been. So we went in. Um, after the 2017 season, this spring, 2018, we went out into the East Woods and we marked up two little quadrants up night up by Macaulay, <coughs> one on Grove and one in, and we counted the wisteria that had described from the ground. And at that point, we determined that about 83.2% of the plants were dead. However, um, a week later, more plants had, had emerged, so it wasn't that good at field rate non native Here's a uh, control of uh, Ernie Kawasaki building at Woodland Park between Cherry and Maple. We um, cut the wisteria, but we, uh, we were, we're reboarders and we're not authorized to use any um, chemical treatment. So you can see all along the ground, all this is restrouted wisteria. It's really hard to control manually. Um, IPC provides us us with each work day with the trails that they worked on. They uh, told us exactly what chemicals that they used and the, the, the chemical makeup and how much they used and what plants that they were talking. So every time we went in, they either did cut and paint or they had backpack, backpack sprayers with specific targets in these woods. This spring, I went on the bird walk with uh, Sad Amagai, and these are some of the plants that we saw that had already been sprouted right along the trails. These were the trails that had been sprayed the previous year, and already non native, uh, I mean, already native plants were starting to uh, come forth. Um, in the Westwoods this summer, we noticed some um, wavy basket grass, and uh, there's a mid Atlantic crisis with uh, wavy basket grass. Um, they're trying to control it before it gets completely out of control. And so we had spotted some along some of the trails and a group of um, residents in town and um, directed by Jay Everhart and Charlie Charleston, we had volunteers. And this is, um, this is Lisa and Mary and um, <coughs> Missy who were all outfitted so they wouldn't uh, spread the seeds any further. And they came in and did some trail um, Pulling, hand pulling up wavy leaf basket grass. But there was a lot more that could be done in a few short hours. So we did have IPC come and they located some up here near Saybrook and did some um, spraying of wavy leaf basket grass. And this actually was the second year because the first year when we found it, I had gone and pulled some the previous year. But this was an emergency situation and this is the only chemicals that we used in the rest of it. Uh, we have continued to have manual work days, <clears throat> maintaining the trails and dealing with non-native invasive plants. And here on the right, you can see a group of volunteers who <coughs> were um, staking out some of those trees that we planted up on Sabro. The fringe trees also have been terribly nibbled, so we're trying to protect those. <coughs> this is what a healthy forest cabin should look like. You 
look up and you see you see the, the canopies with a little bit of a sky. And <coughs> as you have things like blowdowns, you start to get holes like this, and the sunlight comes in. And um, non-native invasive plants have the advantage to take off in a situation like that. Um, you start to lose your um, native plant sprouting because they're overshadowed by the non-native invasive plants and the back of health, this is what your canopy starts to look like and eventually it could look like this. One forest you can compare is that little forest over by Hershey's that has been severely neglected by the county and we just do not want our forest to look like that. Uh, we also have the third problem of reforestation. This was that area of Nico's trees off the Maple Avenue extended, what we call the Maple Trail. We had lost a lot of sheep oaks, and there was this whole big area. And it did green over pretty quickly with my minute. <laughs> but um, Megan had a Nico's Trees Fund, and the Woods Committee had some um, money, so we did put in six big trees in this area to start to get some ground cover. And this also was the area where we did the, the DNR, the Maryland DNR trees that were not so successful. We did some planning this fall. If, as you go down the Cherry Trail and cross that little wooden bridge to the left, there was an area that had low down oaks. And then the bush honeysuckle came in and it looked lush and green, but it was all non-native invasive plants. And when IPC cleaned this area and got the bush honeysuckle and the mulberry out, uh, uh, Barberry out. It was just there. So we put in um, three oak trees, thin oak, and two oak cobbles, and then what should be a beautiful dogwood, It'd be a beautiful site to come across that bridge. Um, this is the area of old sacred that we planted trees, the oak, the maple, some bridge trees, and some holly. And this is some of the trail maintenance. One of our goals is to get the trails a little more defined so that people are more comfortable going into the woods and aren't sleeping and falling. This is some of the volunteers that some of the pictures that we've taken this fall, volunteer efforts. We try to keep the town, the town residents posted with what we do. We each month post in the town bullet and occasionally we'll post things on the list serve. And uh, we have a, a site on the Woods Committee site on the town website where we have our mission statement and our vision. And we hope to get some more, um, more permanent things on some of the projects that we do. So coming forward. So moving forward um, as we're going into our current fiscal year, um, obviously we've already started to meet with uh, Montgomery County slash DNR, but Montgomery County Deer Management Program. Thank you, Bill, for coming. We actually had a meeting with them some months ago. A lot of the Woods Committee went up to their offices and we got some mentoring to get some basic understanding of, you know, what we need to do to try to um, know what the options are on the table. We're going to talk about that in a second to help reduce overbrowsing of deer in our town, in our east and west woods, but basically in town as a whole. Um, also, of course, we're conducting this information. We need done others, as you know, in the past, over the past couple of years. Um, again, inviting our experts in deer control and forest health, Mr. Jonathan, to inform our town residents. So we're just trying to keep everyone um, abreast of what's going on. We, uh, Joe and I actually were fortunate enough to take some recent training um, thanks to the Maryland Woodland, Maryland Woodland Stewards uh, training program that's put on by the University of Maryland and also the Maryland Native Plant Society. We've gone to some of their meetings. So we're trying to educate ourselves and we're trying to pass that forward to you guys as sort of being a conduit of information to develop these long range plans for reforestation and to restore our forest ecosystem. We're going to continue the um, non-native invasive plant control process in the east and west woods. You know, the more that we see and the more that we get in there, the more we're trying to just clear out some of the non-natives. We see where the problems are and how we need to work towards regaining the native plants. And also just continue to evaluate. I mean, this is not something that we're just out there doing indiscriminately. We're looking at veterans. We're trying to measure our successes and share that information with you. So again, thank you. There are a lot of the folks from the Woods Committee that are here tonight. Thank you all very much. We've had um, great meetings and we're having a lot of productive uh, discussions and again, trying to move those plans forward. So thanks to all of you uh, for that. This is also a sign. This to me is, I, I tend to like, have, like visuals. I really like visual images. This is iconic for me. 
Okay, I didn't grow up in this town, so I'm still a newbie, but Joan did, and a lot of me did. So I look at these kinds of signs that have been around for years, and they tell me something. They tell me the root and the sort of sense of this town, and that, to me, talks about a forest preserve. It talks about a bird sanctuary. And it's very meaningful to me as sort of an outsider. I'm 20-something years here, right? So it's just, you know, a few days. Um, but that tells me that what this town is rooted in, and I, I hope you feel the same way. So I just want to always keep that, that kind of mental picture. Your cooperation is appreciated. It's important <laughs> message. And your cooperation is appreciated, exactly. Um, so with that, we just wanted to give you a quick sort of update on what we've been doing and our plans trying to go forward. What I'd like to do right now is turn over to the experts. Again, we're just the, you know, opening day here, the warm up act. We want to uh, introduce uh, Bill, who's going to talk first tonight, and he is, hang on for a second. By the way, uh, for all of you who got one of these little questionnaires, the reason that we're handing these out is as you listen to the information that's presented tonight, I'd like you to please look at the questions that are there. We're trying to get a sense also of how you feel about what we're trying to accomplish for the town. I mean, we're not here trying to do it in isolation. So we'd appreciate some of your feedback on the questions that we developed, and just put them anonymously in the box in the back. Um, and we'll pull back that information and we're going to share that with the town council. So I'd like to introduce Bill Hamilton. He is the manager of the Department of Parks and Natural Resources Stewardship Section, and he's the chair of the Fairmont County Deer Work Group. Um, he's been a member since 1995, and by the way, he also co-authored the Comprehensive Management Plan for Whitetail here in North Fairmont County, Maryland. So without further ado, I'm handing you this is no forward and back, and here. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Uh, in addition to running the Whitetail Deer Management Program in the Women County Parks, I also oversee the Not Native Invasive uh, Program. So I'm all too familiar with the complexity of this problem. And uh, I also recognize all too familiar with the kind of citizenry here, special hands for the complex issue and a uh, divisive issue. So as, as I was introduced, uh, I am the chair of Montgomery County's Deer Management Work Group. And uh, that group came about in 1995 as problems in Montgomery County began to arise. So your county council started to get complaints from citizens like yourselves. And uh, they began to uh, familiarize themselves with what they'll do ask a group of experts to begin to familiarize themselves with the impacts. And those impacts that you're all too familiar with include deer vehicle collisions, uh, damage to your ecological systems. Uh, agricultural damage at the time was very prominent. It was actually the, the leading reason that uh, the deer management working came to be. As you can imagine, there's a tremendous economic impact uh, to agriculture. They were some of the first to experience deer impacts in the county. Many landowners like yourself are experiencing some landscape damage and damage to your lawns. Um, more recently, there's always the uh, concern for Lyme disease. Uh, I'm sure many of you have varying opinions, as do I. Uh, but there are uh, zoonotic diseases that can be transferred from deer to humans. And uh, one of the bigger issues that uh, we're concerned with these days is the feces, the fecal matter in your lawns and in your uh, open areas have more uh, a likely opportunity to cause illness than, than the Lyme disease as it pertains to the year. Uh, so there are a variety of issues that have kind of brought this deer uh, population issue to the forefront. And these are just a few. I'm going to start off by saying that our goal from the county level is to achieve balance. Right now, I shouldn't say right now because we've been doing this for 25 years, but in your case, and in many cases, uh, tolerance of deer impacts is low and deer populations are high. Ultimately, we're trying to achieve some middle ground, uh, and that needs to be accomplished through what we consider a comprehensive uh, approach. You need to be considerable of all the available tools in the toolbox, and you need to be willing to take steps to achieve a variety of impact reductions. So they mentioned non-native invasive, they mentioned caging of reforestation plots. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about deer population management. 
there are a variety of tools that can be used, and if you're going to be successful uh, at attaining your objectives and, and trying to alleviate a variety of impacts, you're going to need to use all of those tools. There is no one magic bullet here, I can assure you. <coughs> I should have never mentioned, you know, um, why, how we've gotten here. We've gotten here as a result of a variety of landscape changes, um, many of which occurred in the late 80s and, and early 1990s. There was a dramatic uh, increase in the amount of development through our county. Thank you. Uh, agricultural uh, entities started to lose money, and because of development, they started to <coughs> sell their land. Environmentalism became quite prominent. Uh, in 1994, we created an environmental guideline for development in the county that actually uh, enhanced our parkland, uh, started to protect a lot of forests, uh, required <coughs> reforestation uh, across the county. All of that made ideal habitat for white tailed deer. <coughs> At the same time, we were restricting them. Uh, many of you have been residents here in Washington Grove for many, many years. Uh, there was a time I lived in Montgomery County from the mid-1980s until the mid-1990s, right around 2000. And for many of those years, you could not walk into a 7-Eleven camouflage without being chased out of town. The county was unwelcome, and it was unnecessary, and a lot of folks that moved into the county were unfamiliar with hunting. And so, as a result of being uh, an unfriendly community to hunters, and for trying to increase safety to their citizenry, the Montgomery County Police created a lot of uh, regulation to restrict hunting to better protect the county. All of these things created a perfect storm, and Whitetail really, kind of really got a strong foothold in the county. So in 1993, a variety of people came together uh, to form a, a Whitetail Deer Task Force in the county. It was made up of government officials, animal protection agencies, uh, agriculturalists, general citizens. Uh, there were 21 individuals that were represented. And the chair at the time was uh, Mr. Jonathan Davidian, who at the time worked for uh, the Center for Further Ecology in Washington, D.C., and later uh, worked for the Humane Society of the United States. <coughs> he created a task force report that had a number of action items uh, that were recommended to our county government. And the very first was to try and eliminate uh, the divisiveness on, on these committees. And they were unable to attain any uh, any collaborative opinion of what the next step was, other than yes, there's a problem, and yes, there are impacts, but we, we can't decide as a group how to move forward. And so his number one recommendation was to continue to study this problem and to utilize government entities that had a network more directly at stake and to eliminate the devices. And that's where the Montgomery County Hearings and Work Group evolved from. And that work group uh, has been in place from 1995 until today, so we're going into our 24th year. Uh, it's made up of uh, Montgomery County Parks, Maryland DNR, uh, the Montgomery County Soil Conservation District, which is our uh, Maryland Cooperative Extension Agent in the county. Uh, and then we have uh, Montgomery County Police Department, <coughs> National Parks, Washington Suburban Sand Dairy Commission, and City of Rockville. And then we've had a few groups that have come and gone through the years uh, in their participation. But by and large, is what you'll see there is the large landowners and the people who have uh, governing responsibility for deer and deer management in the county and the state. And uh, our first order of business was to reevaluate uh, the problem of impacts uh, to kind of set the stage for how to uh, evaluate them scientifically. And then secondly, we created a, a comprehensive management plan for white-tailed deer. And that laid the groundwork for what was to come, uh, which is to comprehensively address impacts, to set clear objectives and goals uh, to address those impacts moving forward. That document is here, and it is on our web page, and I'll provide there. There's a web page address, and uh, I'll put the post to your engine, and it's right there. So that plan was am amended in 2004. Uh, there hasn't been, believe it or not, there's been a lot of technology addressed. There hasn't been much uh, change since that time. We'll probably give it another review in the upcoming year. And then, in addition, 
annually, this work group gets together and we review our objectives and goals. We, have, we review the, the various programs that are occurring in the county, the technology that's going on, and we make recommendations to our county council and to the varying county government agencies represented in the county. So, for example, uh, State Highway, we provide a letter to the State Highway Administration every year identifying hot spots for deer vehicle collisions. We make recommendations for where and when they can uh, achieve better fencing. We make recommendations for road projects and uh, how they can address deer vehicle collisions in some of their upcoming road projects. And so each government agency representative of the county will receive a list of recommendations from this group to help guide and implement some of these uh, strategies to reduce individual impacts. So what have we done today? The very first strategy was to educate our public. We needed them to be familiar with what deer impacts were, to be familiar with deer ecology, and to understand the realities of what was to come. And so some of these technologies are, are long gone, but we started with a uh, a deer brochure that was distributed through our uh, public libraries and other public buildings. There's a variety. We assemble all of the fact sheets and uh, technical information and made it available to our public. And in more recent years, we've created a deer web page, uh, parksdeermanagement.org. This is the clearinghouse for all deer information in the county. You can read the deer management plan, our annual reports, driving in deer country uh, advice. Any and all information pointing to and about deer management is available on that web page. Uh, of the, we're doing social media outreach in this day and age. That's the way we're getting most of our uh, information out. So for example, right now we have a tremendous amount of deer vehicle collisions occurring on the road. It's the running season for deer. And uh, we have uh, Twitter and Facebook posts going out pretty much once a week, just awaring our, awaring our public and our particularly Montgomery Park's uh, followers, that this is time to be aware of the strategies they can take to reduce uh, the likelihood of having occurs. Um, we do a, a wide variety of uh, outreach like this. We do, we get called uh, by local media, we do some uh, local cable TV shows, uh, to kind of get the word out there. And then in somewhat related fashion, there is a Lyme disease website that the health department uh, put together a couple of years ago, and they also did a brochure, and we worked closely with their staff to uh, kind of develop some of the strategies. Mentioned some of these strategies for deer vehicle collisions, but we set out to better understand deer vehicle collisions. Uh, they certainly happen. We're, we're experiencing about 2,000 a year in Montgomery County, and those are just those that were reported. They're very dangerous. Uh, there was a, a story on the news today about a, a woman in, in New Jersey. A deer was catapulted through the front windshield of the vehicle and in the back seat, and it just destroyed the car. Uh, thankfully, she was on the harm, but uh, not everybody is so lucky. One of our county council members a few years ago, George Leventhal, was in an accident on the Beltway and broke a vertebrae. He was pretty, uh, pretty damaged and has been traumatized since. He's been for the year end and ever since. And I've been in one vehicle uh, accident myself involving a deer, and it was pretty horrific. It was one of the worst accidents I've been in. Uh, and so we needed to better understand what, why these were occurring and where. And we began to assemble a means of mapping these. Uh, we utilized a variety of tools, including Montgomery uh, County Police, uh, to record deer vehicle collisions, and we can map them and track and analyze them uh, every year. We created the first year management uh, uh, map involving deer vehicle collisions where we literally stuck stickers in every spot. And in this day, we're using geographic information systems. We can compile the data electronically through a spreadsheet and analyze it spatially and temporally uh, across the county to see what might be occurring. We can make an educated hypothesis about you know, why they're occurring there. And most importantly, uh, in places where we've chosen to manage the population, we can evaluate the effectiveness of that work and see if it's having the, uh, the intended outcome. Several of these other things I've mentioned, but we do PSAs throughout the year. Uh, we work with our uh, county
United Road Agencies. Uh, you're one of the unfortunate recipients of our inner county connector, uh, being one of your neighbors. Uh, as a Department of Parks, we fought that tooth and nail, but we didn't win. Uh, but what we did, we're, we were able to achieve uh, better fencing, a lot of bridge structure, and some wildlife underpasses as part of that uh, project because we had the data to demonstrate where the your vehicle collision were occurring and the damage that was occurring as a result. And so we, uh, we increased the cost load for that roadway quite a bit, um, but for good calls. I think it's one of the more successful uh, examples of roads that were built with deer in mind. There are high fence, ferry fence, there are escape mechanisms for deer to get off the roadway if they do wind up on it. And there's some of the more, most extensive bridging structures that we've uh, ever built in the county. About five years ago, I participated on the uh, Council of Governments. Scott created a wildlife subcommittee to address this issue uh, from a regional perspective. And one of the outcomes was to create a DVD uh, driving uh, PSA. We distributed those to all of our public libraries. All of the driving schools have them, and we make them available. I think uh, the COD website uh, provides a COD by which you can uh, request that. And more or less, it's, just, it's a DVD 12 minute that kind of gives uh, drivers a little bit of the background about your big collisions and how to protect themselves against that. And then I can't claim this, but this is one of our first. Uh, iterations of trying to create new and novel uh, near vehicle sign collision signage. Uh, one of the messages that we heard from SHA and from our public was that people had just long forgotten those old triangular signs of deer had become such a uh, routine occurrence in the landscape that people didn't recognize them as being a threat. And, uh, as it were the case, Many of those signs go up and are never taken down, whether they're a high vehicle collision accident area or not. Just a few examples. Many of you might have heard of the street or wildlife reflector systems. We've used those in the county. We've really tried our hand at everything. To reduce damage to private properties, uh, fencing, repellent, habitat operation, we're using this on parks. We have our botanical gardens in Brookside, if you're familiar, has a high fence. Uh, with deer cattle breaks to keep uh, deer from crossing through some of the gate mechanisms. Uh, our Oak Farm Nursery has high fence. We've utilized fencing in a lot of uh, locations. We don't utilize a lot of uh, repellents on parkland because it just is not very cost effective at the landscape level that we're working. Um, but we've taught a lot of our public how to utilize these on our own private property. When we started this venture, you could not have a residential fence on, on your property. And uh, a lot of people just wanted to be able to exclude deer. So we worked with the county council to enact legislation that allows limited fencing on, on private property. You can see this is just two examples. One being the Master Gardener's facility on Parkland. And believe it or not, this is a, a deer-proof fence. Uh, they have to put white flagging here to kind of make sure that people and animals are aware that it's there. And that's just one for those of you that uh, want zero tolerance for your uh, herbaceous plants and, and shrubbery. Uh, that might be the way you might look at it. We also recognize that deer population management is an essential component of addressing deer impacts, whether it's lethal or non lethal. You know, each of you has to make their own determination. But Addressing population management is essential, and we've done that pretty vigorously in Montgomery County. We started with uh, adjusting the mag limits in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, we worked with DNR uh, to allow an increase in the bow hunting uh, bag limits, and that just snowballed. As that was found successful and proved safe to our county council, they started uh, investigating and requesting additional bag limit changes uh, through regulated hunting. We've changed the county weapons regulations. I would say Parks has not been a part of that, nor has uh, uh, the deer management work group. But the county has pretty aggressively changed its weapon regulations <coughs> to allow more liberal uh, hunting opportunities. Uh, there is a 
about two thirds of our county, if you're familiar with the uh, the agricultural zone, anything inside of the, the urban area of the agricultural zone is restricted to bow and arrow hunting only. Uh, and so that has been, been changing through the years. And in the past five years, the county has enacted two archery uh, liberaliz liberalization of the archery zone. It used to be 150 yards, that was a state uh, regulation. The county through legislation reduced that to 100 yards about three years ago, and just last season they reduced that to 50 yards. Um, as a landowner, you can eliminate that altogether. We've created deer management programs in most of the public lands in Newcomen County. There's still a fair amount of county park land uh, where we simply have not been able to effectively implement anything. But by and large, all of the land, all of the large land parcels in Montgomery County have some type of deer population management going on. Uh, these are just a few names. Uh, we have always been, I say we, Montgomery Parks, we are the largest landowner of open space in the county. Even though it's only 10% of the county's uh, forest, we have a tremendous amount of, of green space, and we also have a lot of suburban development that surrounds that green space. And so we're often pointed at as the number one contributor to the year. So we've kind of taken the lion's share of, of responsibility for implementing and kind of leading uh, some of these efforts. And much like I'm doing this evening, uh, we always lend ourselves to educational outreach to kind of give private landowners and property owners uh, some background information about how they can address white tail deer on their property whether it's population management or other means. Agricultural damage, I mentioned that uh, it was one of, the, one of the leading reasons that the county became interested in whitetail deer management. And there's still a lot that we have to learn about the damage that deer are doing to agriculture and some of the real impacts. But uh, we've offered educational workshops. Uh, Mr. John McKay has participated in one or two of those uh, with us during the early years. Uh, the county has created a budget line item uh, by which hunters can take their deer to these two processing facilities and leave them there so that they can harvest above and beyond what they can personally consume. Uh, those deer are then taken to a processing facili facility uh, where they're turned into usable product and then distributed to area charities. Uh, and that's just a mechanism by which hunters can increase their take on agricultural lands and lands surrounding them. Uh, in the past couple of years, there's been a fencing grant program uh, that our agriculturalists have uh, access to, and uh, it's very limited. I think it's 10 acres and below. But if you're an agricultural provider uh, on a small scale, you can get some funding to help you exclude deer from your property. Uh, and there are a number of agriculturalists, particularly some of the uh, boutique agricultural enterprises that are choosing to fence their properties, property orchards being, being one that's up here in the northern end of the county. And then we encourage them to get some data collection and analysis going. Uh, and we've been able to do some great things with some of their GIS and GPS data. They're collecting that by, by tractor and we're seeing where damage is occurring, uh, both on the course scale at the countywide level, but also on their fields and adjacent to parkland. And so by analyzing some of that data, we're able to make more uh, profound and, and impactful uh, recommendations. I mentioned, in my opinion, deer population management is, a, is an essential step. Uh, there's been a lot. Obviously, there's lethal deer population management, and there's non-lethal deer population management. Both are occurring pretty readily and, and uh, routinely in the county now. Um, There's benefits both from trying to fill the ecological need of uh, predation. You know, right now, there's not a lot of natural predation occurring in Montgomery County, although we're starting to see some coyote populate. No, coyotes are well established in the county. We just don't know how well they're managing some of the deer. Uh, and bear and bobcats are starting to make their way back into the county a little bit. So we're expecting that uh, natural mortality will be increasing through the years. But when we began this uh, charge in 1995 and right up until now, 
humans are really the only population means uh, of predation. And so it does kind of help to balance some of those uh, evolutionary elements that we are taking advantage of. Uh, they're able to repopulate exponentially, they grow very rapidly in, in the absence of high mortality rate. And some of these uh, programs help to address that. The non-lethal, I mentioned some of this uh, fancy and exclusion, but really what, in regards to population management, we're talking about uh, immune contraception and cervical sterilization. Both of those programs are occurring or have occurred in Montgomery County, and uh, we're always open-minded to our system for how we can utilize them on part. We currently are not utilizing any of the non-lethal uh, population management strategies on our Park 
uh, four years ago. And in addition to the deer vehicle collision dropping, uh, Paint Ranch is one of our best natural areas. It's been on the decline. It's a highly fragmented park. It's been inundated with uh, development. Uh, but nonetheless, we're seeing a radical change in the landscape. Now, what I will tell you is these are all spring ephemerals. Uh, I'm trying to be spurred overly. There's some travel in here, May apple, uh, bloodroot, spring, beauty. I'm not sure. That looks like a trillion. These are all spring ephemerals that are rare, and they're also highly uh, palatable deer. And just after three years of implementation, we're finding that these have all come back into the main branch stream down the park. Now, I will, I will let you know that these are spring ephemerals. They come up before a lot of the other vegetation is, is coming up, and when the deer population is at, at its absolute lowest point. So it's before the, uh, uh, the birding season in the spring, early summer. And so it, these might be a little bit uh, marginalized uh, when the population gets larger in the summer. But you can see, we've only dropped this population down. We're taking about 30 deer. So we're, taking, we're leaving about 30 deer per square mile. And the literature would have you believe that it's not ideal. And you, you, know, you really want to lower that deer population as much as you can if your goal is to see revegetation you know, re and some of your rare threat and danger plant species. But we've been very excited. I don't think that we've ever broken the 20 deer per square mile mark. We seem to float right around that 30 deer per square mile mark. And we're starting to see in many of our parks uh, a resurgence of some of these rare threat and danger plant species. And it's really got our plant ecologists excited. And a lot of the citizen scientists that do work with us uh, are reporting having seen things that they haven't seen in 20 or 30 years. So that's the end of my presentation. I do have some other slides. I would say I, I, I don't like these presentations as much as I like discussing things with, with you and answering questions. But I do have some other slides that I can address. But what I, I want to just provide some advice for you. First and foremost, you need to have clear goals for what you, you're expected to do with your woods property. You have a unique opportunity in that you're somewhat of an isolated enclave community and you have isolated woods. It's encouraging to hear that you have such so much volunteerism in your, in your community and care. And so you can really make dramatic impacts with such with being able to focus on a smaller area. That said there are some constraints to your woodland and woodland with the edge effect and such. Um, but set clear goals and base it base them on your values as a community and, and where where you want to be in the long term. But you need to be able to make sure that you can achieve those goals. Otherwise, you're, you're attacking a very divisive uh, situation without much hope. Be cautious of scientific absolutes. They're, these are all novel circumstances that we're dealing with. And yes, deer are a tremendous impact to woods and to the community, but there are other impacts that we're just learning about. Uh, soil chemistry and air chemistry, climate change, there are a whole host of non-native invasive problems that we can get to understand. Um, these all have a variety of impacts. And you just want to be cautious about being sold any bill of goods that is too good to believe. You, know, it's, uh, you need to be very cautious of what you believe and always exploring uh, science. And most importantly, as a, as a community, you need to progress with the results. As I mentioned several times, this is an extremely divisive topic, and it can divide communities, and I don't want to see you guys in that circumstance. I've witnessed it before. I've seen HOAs tear themselves apart uh, without ever coming to a conclusion on how to act. Um, there will be very outspoken people within your community, and uh, you want to make sure that everybody gets a voice at the table and is heard and uh, gets the opportunity express their opinions and feelings. Uh, and if you're not really willing to act on this and go full bore, uh, you probably should stay out of the business. And then finally, obviously, we're always here for you. 
my contact information uh, is available. My staff, uh, my staff contacts are here. Uh, Ryan Butler and Dave Peterson oversee our leader management program. They can help guide at any time through this process uh, to give you some of the uh, pros and cons and the learning experiences that we encounter. Uh, but we are here to serve you guys and to kind of help you process this information. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Cates. Said I have some other slides here that we that might come in to be helpful if questions arise. And I think you're going to save questions for you. Well, actually, I was going to suggest we might take a few questions from you first, if you don't mind now. Um, because otherwise we're going to start talking about it's interconnected, which is why we're having them both here. But do you have any particular questions, actually, for Bill about the deer management? We've provided over a million uh, servings in, through our Park Police Sharpshooting Program over the course of its 18 year run. So we're donating about 25,000 pounds of venison a year into the uh, Capital Area Food Bank that serves the District of Columbia, Prince George's County, and Montgomery County. Um, I, it's the silver lining. You know, we are often told that we should lean on that because it's a happy story at the end of the deer population management. And I'm somewhat hesitant to do that. But all of that meat does go to the cause uh, at a time more than ever when people need particular protein. Um, it's it's very useful. Uh, I can't speak to the, the hunting program that I mentioned for Montgomery County. They do far fewer numbers. I think they donate approximately 150 deer per year to that program. And you're, you're averaging about 30 to 35 pounds for each of those animals. And that program is donated through the Maryland Food Bank, which distributes to other counties in Maryland. Yes? You cautioned um, us that we do not have a collective um, sense of will to move forward. We should not, you know, engage. What would happen to our woods if we did not? Well, the short answer is we don't know. I'm sure Jonathan Cage will speak to that to some extent. Uh, deer have been identified as a keystone species. They have a dramatic impact. And so if you have a very distinct direction for where you want your wood lot to go and the species that you want to, to happen, uh, it's likely that there will be changes that were out of your control if you don't take some steps. As I mentioned, this is a multivariate issue. You've got other impacts that are kind of compounding now, and so every step you can take to ensure responsible address uh, will have a benefit. Uh, but there's a lot to learn. We have a lot to learn. Thank you. Yes. This is sort of an unrelated question, but you mentioned at the beginning <coughs> uh, that even more than uh, uh, <laughs> lung disease, the, the feces, spread diseases, what, what is that? Well, there are bacterial diseases. There's E. <coughs> coli. There's a number of things like that that, that can be transferred. Okay. So there are bacterial. Uh, and is there any concern about the donation of venison? At this point, there are no known uh, disease transmission from venison. There, if you've heard of chronic waste disease, that's one of the more prominent uh, deer health issues that is showing signs that there may be some concern. But at this point, it's not in Montgomery County. There's been no real cases found to be to effectively transmit. Uh, it's something that there's still a lot of research going on. Uh, but at this point, no. And that's found in meat usually that's not not the meat, it's just butchered and used to bring the issue of other things. So. Yeah. I mean, I want to take a question for her. Um, I hear a lot that it's because of the population of the deer in our woods that, that they're not healthy, that they're suffering. Um, and I wonder if you can speak to that. Do you find that in other places in Montgomery County? I don't. I've been doing this for 25 years. I've uh, Examined deer from all over the county in the most densest of populations. I have not really found any that I would call unhealthy. Uh, 
Um, I will say clearly during the summer of the year when female when does are uh, are nursing their young, they can appear extremely uh, thin and gaunt, <coughs> but they're more or less healthy. We've had some rough winters lately. There's, you know, not necessarily last year, but there was a string of two or three winters when we were finding that deer were having to result, resort to evergreens for some sustenance. Um, they looked pretty <coughs> rough there. But these are well-fed animals. Um, we have fertilized lawns and landscapes uh, that are replaced every year. I have not seen too much evidence of deer that are unhealthy. It, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which had uh, over 300 deer in a one square mile in, in enclosure uh, with literally nothing but grass to graze on at the time, um, we had to do necropsies on those deer if they died as a result of some of the contraceptive experimentation. And you would take femur, you would crack the femur bone to evaluate the level of fat. And even those deer weren't showing any signs of malnutrition. So I don't think. Uh, now, nourishment is a real issue in the government county. That's been my experience. You have a second question? Oh, I think the big issue there is that the is that is all the other wildlife that you remove from the area as a result that is no longer there because of allowing overrunness of deer. I have one other question. Sure. It's my understanding that Montgomery County requirements for archery um, management here is more stringent than the state, is that right? For Montgomery Parks, that is absolutely correct. So we have a variety of deer management tools, but about four years ago, we implemented archery on park. It was our first allowance of, of archery program, and we had very strict criteria. So these individuals have to go through a background check uh, we go through a national background check, the same that uh, preschools and volunteer programs go through. Uh, they have to demonstrate having uh, a higher level of competency with uh, their hunter education. There is what's called the International Bowling and Education Program. Uh, we have a very strict shooting proficiency test that they have to go through. Um, and there's a variety of things. So what that's led us to is we are experiencing a We've had zero complaints from the public. Um, we actually have hunting occurring along the Great Seneca Trail uh, in the Aethersburg, and there's been not one complaint from the public when they have interaction with the hunters. And we've had extremely low wounding rates, uh, which is one of the, the uh, more prominent reasons that people don't want to support archery, and something that we took very seriously as well. Um, we have some of the lowest wounding rates that we've ever heard of across the country. So yes, in, in Maryland, as long as you're a hunting license, you're at a bow hunting stand, you're legal to hunt on public land and on private property. On Montgomery Park's property, you have to do a whole hell of a lot more to, to be approved. Uh, we think it speaks volumes about the success and uh, the tolerance from our citizens. Management, developing a deer management program earlier on. Uh, 
back in the 1990s when uh, we were just kind of getting into this. And I'm also a forest land owner. I own 330 acres of forest land myself in West Virginia. Um, so, the Pat asked me to talk about some things related to some of the situations here. So, you know, after hearing some of the presentations, I might have actually changed a couple of things. But um, I've also read through you know, the Woodland Stewardship, stewardship Plan that's been developed. And uh, I'll just say at the outset, I'm really impressed with the track that you know, you're taking here in terms of. Uh, the steps you're taking would be the steps that I would recommend, most recommend to any private woodland owner or manager that manages some land. Now, I'll put it this way that, uh, you know, when we talk about woodland stewardship, which is a lot of what I do in talking about people about stewardship, is, you know, it encompasses a couple of things here. You know, feeling a sense of responsibility, knowing the opportunities, uh, and aware of the consequences of actions, and being some level of objectives. And that's what's been kind of clearly laid out in that far stewardship plan that you have there, because a lot of people will make assumptions about, about land, about things they don't know much about, and they really don't understand what are the implications of the, of the consequences of certain actions. And I hear this question being asked here about, well, what happens if we don't do anything over the deer? Well, there's definitely going to be an unsustainable situation in terms of the ecology of the forest land with high deer populations like that. And I'll, Get into that in a minute, but you know, this is a copy of your plan here. I've read through it, and it's done by a really good professional forester. And most of all plans like this, you know, if you have objectives of forest health and recreation and wildlife, but all plans have to some good maps, identify and survey the forest land, look at the, the trees that are there, the, uh, how they're growing, the size, and all those kinds of things, and the regeneration, which really is the big issue here, is the lack of regeneration of the forest. I mean, it's just not there. Okay? So, what do you do about that? But then some recommendations, the timeline, and perhaps most important, where the stage you are now, you can take up some actions. All too often, a lot of these forest stewardship plans are developed primarily for tax purposes, because in the state of Maryland, with the Woodland Assessment Law, uh, landowners can get quite a good you know, current use assessment on forest land uh, if they get a forest stewardship plan. And many times, there's minimal things that have to be done if they if that's all they want to do. So a lot of plants sit on the shelf, that's not what we want here. But you know, this is all about sustainable management. And you know, it's kind of you've probably heard these terms before about managing the meat needs of today without compromising the ability for future generations. So we have these situations that have arisen with deer and invasive species and the impacts of regeneration. You know, what do we do? You know, we're left with this situation. Uh, and uh, you know, how do we make it as, uh, this forest as a sustainable entity for the next thousand years. And uh, this is great. I mean, you guys have 80 acres of, of woodland. That's <clears throat> for a small community. This is kind of like a lot of communities up in uh, New England. This is very common uh, where they have their own, you know, uh, town forest and things like that. But very unusual down here in, the, in this part of the Mid-Atlantic and stuff. But you get Pennsylvania and up in New England. It's very common for communities like this to have some, uh, you know, counties where a uh, town forest. And they grapple with the same things. They have town meetings about what, how they're going to manage it, what they're going to do. And of course, they, uh, that, the same thing is going to do Well, this is just a couple of pictures I threw out here. The great thing about today with the internet is you can get great maps. You know, you can get great maps, you know, but you, know, you have your West Woods. Oops. You have your West Woods here, which is primarily a, a yellow poplar, a large diameter yellow poplar, upland site. Uh, and down here, uh, this old, old oak woods, uh, very old forest. When you see yellow poplar like this, this is probably an old field at one time and uh, was, you know, abandoned. And that's what happens when you have high, fer high fertile sites like that are abandoned, probably exposed soil, and seeds grow very quickly, and you get a dense yellow poplar forest. I can understand there's been some cutting in there, World War I, World War II. Uh, but that's what you get when you get into the swamp land down here, which is mostly wetland, that lot of us down here, it's oak forest. And when you see oak forest, those are old forests, because they're very late successional forests. They've been around for hundreds of years, uh, more than likely. So uh, this is a kind of, a, this is another map that we have. Uh, if you ever want great maps, just go to ndmerlin.net. Maryland's taken all their GIS data, and they put it into a user-friendly interface called mdmerlin.net. So you can type your address in, and it'll take you, you know, all these overlays. You can put in parcel boundaries, wetlands, all kinds of different photography that's available. 
And in fact, you can put on the boundaries and then you can actually look up the parcel and take it to the Maryland property search and you can see how much your uh, neighbor's house is worth. <laughs> how much time is it's, it's very invasive, I've got to be honest with you. Talk about invasive species. <laughs> so, but this is all, these are like wetland areas that are in that, in that whole woods area. And walking around here today with my, <laughs> with my uh, office shoes, I found that out. But, uh, you know, Pat asked me kind of to address a couple things here. The steer issue, the basic species, the generation, the forest service size. So that, and I you know, don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to hit a couple of the high points. And because uh, I know this, you know, late in the evening. But uh, this is what Bill was mentioning. You know, deer are what's known as a keystone species, okay? They control all the other species in the ecosystem. And it depends on that. So that if they were removed, the system would change dramatically. And this is what you see here. These are some older pictures from the Black Hills Regional Park. This is what deer do. Okay, it makes it look like a park. And a lot of people think that looks great because they like the park. But that's not the way woods are supposed to look. You're supposed to have different layers of forest, understory, underground. And there's all kinds of wildlife species that live in those different areas. The wildlife is all gone. You know, by allowing overabundant deer, you remove a lot of wildlife from this whole from this whole you know, food web or you know food chain. But when you put up a fence, this is what that same area looks like after a number of years. There's a lot of research that shows, even though invasive species are very aggressive, given the chance and the not the deer pressure, a lot of native species can compete with some of these invasives. But they can't do it when they're being nibbled every year. It's not going to happen. Okay? So, um, but this is a great picture. It kind of shows that keystone uh, function that deer have in the ecosystem. And this is basically what we're seeing that's happening. It's turning these relatively healthy ecosystems into something where basically you have a large canopy of trees and nothing else. So the logical question is, where is the next forest coming from? Well, the only thing that's going to be able to grow in there is the basis because <laughs> nothing else can compete in there. Okay? So, um, and this is just a couple of pictures. This is from Baltimore County, uh, from the reservoir system up there, where they do some plot sampling. No seedling regeneration in the majority of understory spots. No, there's no young seedlings in any of these areas. Okay? 84%. Liberty Reservoir, 74 These are older pictures, but it, should, it really hasn't changed all that much in those areas, to be honest with you. So this is, this is the issue. And as a professional forester, my background is in silviculture. Jobs. Anybody here know what silviculture is? You can tell what that is. trees. It's <laughs> Okay, well, I, I have a tree in my backyard that grows. What's the difference between a tree? Oh, the succession of trees and the lake. Okay, so we're beyond, what's that? To grow trees to harvest them. Well, not necessarily, yeah, okay, but is it just one tree? No, 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 trees. Okay, it's trees in the forest, okay. Arbor, an ar you know what an arbor is, right? An arborist works on individual trees. You know, silviculture involves the, the growing of trees in the forest. Okay, so the, we know that if we to carry out some type of park stunt or some type of planting, we can predict what's going to happen in the future. That's what silviculture is. Silva means tree, you know, in the lab. So, uh, but this is what we see in this ecosystem, this browse line, is actually from an old picture from Seneca Creek State Park I took years ago, it was great. But there's been a lot of research that shows the impact of deer browsing on other wildlife species. Uh, some studies up in Pennsylvania they did. This shows deer density per square mile and the number of songbirds. It's 10 deer per square mile, 18 songbirds, down to 11 and 64 deer per square mile. Now, why do you think there's fewer deer, at fewer uh, songbirds at 11, 64 deer per square mile? Fewer nestings. Right, yeah. There's no habitat. The habitat's gone, okay? And I, I don't have a slide in here, but Population, you really mentioned too much about population dynamics, but you know, deer are capable of fairly quick, uh, high you know, uh, reproductive capabilities. And, and, and you see you know, doubles of twins and triplets in some cases. Just like with humans, you know, when you have you know, more healthy babies, you know, that's a sign of good living, right? <laughs> so, but just to give you a number to put out there, I'm not a professional wildlife biologist, but I work with a lot of them. And just remember this, you have to harvest about 40 to 50% of the doe population each year 
just to maintain the deer population from one year to the next. Bucks really don't enter into it. One buck can service a whole herd of does. You know, it's, it's kind of like our own population sometimes. <laughs> you know, but basically, uh, you know, that's that's the way it works. So you see a couple deer in the backyard. It doesn't take but a couple years maybe before you start seeing these populations double. So that's my point. Just keep that number. If you don't do anything, those populations continue to increase. And like Bill said, they're still relatively healthy. I mean, they're, there's good habitat, but what's suffering as a result is all the other wildlife and all the other ecological processes. So, you know, and uh, some uh, organizations that you would actually consider to be a more fairly, uh, uh, you know, not uh, more conservative or more, more protective of wildlife, which the Nature Conservancy is, you know, a lot of these organizations have been on the bandwagon for years about controlling the deer because they understand the ecological standards. Um, so this is actually a slide, an older slide, but from some from the uh, Montgomery County Parks. But this relationship between invasive species and deer populations, uh, this basically shows that uh, inside the exposures, or uh, outside the exposures, that browsing basically affects species composition. It says like still grass is dense outside of the deer exposures, but not so much yet. Okay. Just makes that point that again, given the chance, natives, if they're protected from deer browsing, can have a good chance of, of competing against a lot of the invasive species that are out there. But you know, the situation you see out here uh, in other places, that's not the case. So um, that's all about deer. So the message is basically that. Deer have an impact um, on the ability of a forest to regenerate, and I'll talk about that. Um, but they have a really big impact on other wildlife populations. So you would be seeing a lot more songbirds out of here. You can see a lot more small mammals, but there's just no habitat. All right, that's, that's the case. So what happens to the forest in the future? Well, there's a lot of uh, things to consider for regeneration and development. We plant a lot of trees these days, right? And we have to use a lot of these tree shelters because otherwise the deer eat them up. Uh, but you know, forest harvesting is another way, another tool we have in terms of uh, you know changing, you know, encouraging uh, regeneration of, of, of the forest systems. Uh, and then there's natural succession. You know, left to its own, everybody here probably knows an ag field if they were a kid. You know, and left to its own devices, it's going to grow into something, right? Around this area of the Mid Atlantic, with the moisture and everything we have, uh, you know, nature abhors the back. Something is going to grow. Okay. So the idea is to really determine what it is you want to grow. Uh, and the biggest problem we have in a lot of these areas is that without any protection from deer, this was an area that was actually was a small clear cut, and it just remains an open field, uh, basically an open area because the deer pressure is so high, nothing can regenerate. It's not going to be a forest. Anymore. And uh, so that's, that's another uh, consequence. So again, I talked to you a little bit about silviculture, the you know, art and science of tending the forest. And you know, that's what I do as a, as a professional forester who's working on private lands or any type of lands, is developing prescriptions that meet the goals and objectives of the landowner, recognizing there's not any one correct answer. There's a lot of options in many cases. You know, that's important, okay? The science is basically, we know, how certain trees work, the characteristics, we have data collection, and we have you know, applications that we can you know, put together. But the point is that concerning what's going to happen in any particular forest, there's an art to it, there's also a real science to it as well. So, um, anybody recognize what is this a picture of? Yeah. So, this is basically a natural a forest that's going through the process of succession. It left to its own, you know, abandoned, uh, or basically even with small trees, it's going to continue to grow with smaller trees, and it's going to grow into an older forest. Uh, those trees that tend to come in first are those that are very intolerant of shade. Okay, they need a lot of full sunlight. All right, and the trees that come in later underneath are those that are very tolerant of shade. Oaks are like that; they're very tolerant of shade. They come in under those ones that come in first. Okay. So when you see an oak forest out there, you see a beech forest, you know, those are probably, those are trees that came in under another forest canopy. And it was probably harvested years ago and then it took over the 
gameplay. So it shows you that old forest over there is, ex is an extremely old forest. Uh, I'm sure if you go back into pictures, you know, from the 1800s, you'll, you'll probably find it. I'm sure it's over 100 years old. No question. Yeah. Because of because of the wetland soils. Okay. Yeah. So and the other thing here, just to make this connection between succession and wildlife, you know, one thing we have an overabundance of is mature forest in a lot of areas. And you know, if you want different types of wildlife, you need different successional stages because different wildlife requires different successional stages. So, for example, if you want to have turkeys. You have to have mature forest, right? But if you also want turkeys, you have to have some open areas so that the young poults can have an area where they can get out there and get the insects and stuff into the, uh, you know, and growing in the spring. So my point is that this whole uh, relationship between succession and uh, wildlife is really important. You guys all have mature forest here, you know, and that's what it's going to be. But again, one one thing that's being encouraged in a lot of cases is trying to develop. Uh, some younger forest growth as well. And of course that's accomplished by some type of harvesting or you know, something that's done in that respect. And that's not necessarily what you're talking interested in here, but it's just a, it's another one of those options that's out there. Um, so this is a progression that shows kind of what happens to a forest that just kind of uh, develops from a, an abandoned old field around here, you might see. So there's a, an old hay field of some sort. and. Uh, Starts to grow. What are those little green things coming up? You know what Juniper, red cedar. Yeah, red cedar, right? Okay. Start to grow up. All of a sudden, they start getting these little hardwoods that start to come in. Some walnuts, cherries, things like that. And all of a sudden, they start to grow up. Those red cedars are very intolerant of shade, right? They need full sunlight. All of a sudden, these hardwoods start to come in. They start to overtop these these red cedars who only grow so tall. So fast, and at some point they start to over, overshadow those those red cedars, and you start to get a hardwood forest in there, and uh, all of a sudden you get the red cedars die out. All right, and given time, basically many areas have end up as hardwood forest. So what happened to all those other trees that were in there? I mean, there were tons of trees in there, weren't there? What happened to all those other trees? At the end of the day, there's maybe 150 trees per acre in there. There's probably you know. 5,000 there, what happened to all those other trees? They died, right? Yeah, so you know, really what we do in forestry is really, we can interject in different areas and control that disturbance and remove certain trees and get certain outcomes by, by, by different types of harvesting, different types of planting, whatever we want to do. So, you know, that's what I do as a forester. And the most important thing here is understanding regeneration. Different species have different regeneration strategies. So for pine trees, like most of your white pine, most of your pine trees require full sunlight. They're not going to grow in the shade. Yellow poplar is the same way. You will not find one yellow poplar sitting growing under yellow poplar because they require full sunlight. And when you open the canopy and dig up the soil, the mineral soil, you'll get a million, in your pop, a million yellow poplars. Oaks, on the other hand, uh, basically their strategy is, is to slow and grow. Uh, you have a lot of oak trees out here in this, in this area here. You have plenty of seeds falling to the ground, and then a lot of them probably germinate, but what happens to them? Deer. 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 Because given, <laughs> given the natural process of things, what would happen is that they would start to grow, and they can grow in the shape of the forest. They would grow up a little bit, then they die back. They grow up, and they die back. And in the process, they're putting on, storing a lot of carbohydrates in the roots. They're building up this big tap root, so that when the canopy someday opens up, they have enough, enough resources to be able to shoot up a sprout from the other regeneration. So my point here is you actually have the regeneration out here for an oak forest. It's just that the deer are eating everything. They don't have the option. So if you remove the deer, you I think you will see, you will start to see regeneration coming back. You'll start to see that coming back. Just like you saw in that other photo with the fencing, right? And in fact, um, Pat showed me there's an explosure in the back there. What, do you know, does that have a name or something back there? It's, it's down by the bridge, the third exposure down by the bridge on Cherry. Look at that exposure, and you will see about probably 15 to 20 oak seedlings in there. And that's exactly what most of that area would look like if the deer were removed. That's a, just a great demonstration 
for how ecology works. So, uh, um, you know, that's just a little lesson that now other trees, like, like I said, like yellow poplar and ash and maple, you know, they need mineral soil to grow. They're not going to grow in the leaf litter. And the soil's got to be dug up, exposed to sunlight, and all of a sudden you get a million uh, of those growing, like uh, yellow poplar. So each of these trees have a regeneration strategy. And again, in silviculture, you can do different things. So like I said, hopes and hickories and walnuts, slow and steady. And one of the biggest sources of regeneration, especially in areas where there's a harvest, is sun sprouts. Hardwood trees we sprout, assuming they're not too big. Okay, usually those especially. But basically, it only sprouts that come out of base. And if you walk around the woods out here with the yellow poplar forest, you'll see a lot of uh, stumps that have more than one stem coming out of them. Those are stump sprouts. Because typically a tree that's from seeds can have one stem. The reason they have two or three is because that was a cut stump. Those sprouts came out, and all those 50 stump sprouts basically competed with each other. Maybe one or two or three of them actually made it. So that tells them, whenever you see a more than double stem trees, hardwood trees, that means you know that those, that area's been forest. It's been a forest harvest area in the past. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so all the stuff about forest trade, about silviculture, silvicultural methods, there's a lot of different methods out there, and they really all vary on one factor, and that is how much of the canopy is removed. If you remove all the canopy, it's called a clear cut. If you remove part of the canopy, it's called a, you know, a thinning or something like that. So uh, that, that's, the, that's the way you think. It's all about the light. Okay. So this is kind of a short lesson in, uh, in, in forestry, but you know, one option that comes into some of these areas you now, uh, as you open up the canopy, we do a lot of things with forest thinning in some forest areas. And what that does is basically it opens up the canopy like this. And assuming the trees are, you keep your good trees, those trees are going to grow out and they're going to fill in that space. In the meantime, they're going to increase their growth rate. So like, for example, I was looking at your yellow poplar forest out there. Some beautiful trees out there. And, uh, but a lot of them, all, some of those areas are very crowded as well. And, you know, one area to grow bigger, one way to grow bigger trees is to, is to thin out some of the ones that can come out of that way, you know, come out of there and will increase the growth of the main trees. And I realize you may not be interested in any harvesting, but I'm just mentioning it's the same type of idea when you give good trees more room to grow, they're going to grow a lot faster and much bigger. And those yellow poplar trees are capable of growing very large. And uh, this is just an example of what thinning can do to a forest. This was an oak forest here. And at this stage of the forest, this part of the forest was thin. This part was not. So in the next 25 years, that's how much the trees grew in diameter. And for the next 25 years in the forest, it was thin because it had all extra room to grow. And we kept the best trees, they grew a lot faster. So just a little bit about you know, dynamics of how trees grow. So, um, I'm just going to say that disturbance is natural, okay? And what silviculture really does is imitates nature. We plant things, sometimes we cut things, sometimes we do absolutely nothing, let nature take its course. And uh, so we're mimicking nature. And what's going to happen with this forest at some point, you know, trees don't live forever. You know, as they get very, very old, you're going to see senescence, you're going to see openings in the canopy. And, uh, uh, I think what you've done here with invasive species is really good because that's the good first thing to do because that problem we have now is get rid of those invasive species. So as holes do come in the canopy or you do other things that there is places and if you reduce the deer herd now, you know, if you decide to go that way, there's going to be room for those other nat natural seedlings to come in and they're not competing with all those invasives. So, um, one question as a forester, I had, well, natives are great, but why are they so important? Well, there's been a lot of research that shows that native plant, a lot of native plants and insects, they develop evolutionary relationships with native species. Okay, so, for example, if you go into a forest of native trees, you can see all the holes in the leaves, all the galls on the leaves, but the trees aren't dead, are they? In other words, the insects have learned how to co-evolve with those things. They eat some of the leaves, the trees still live on, but in many cases, if you look at those invasive species, the leaves are untouched. Nothing is eating them. And I think the problem with that is that with the native species, what's typically eating those things are caterpillars. And caterpillars are the main food source for most of your bird species. 
So there's been a lot of research done with Doug Talley and others that show that in forests where you don't have, where you have a lot of invasives, you have a lot fewer caterpillars produced. So you have a lot less food for wildlife, for, for birds and small mammals. And as a forester, this was a kind of revelation to me about a number of years ago, because I said, yeah, natives are bad, but they really have distinct in, you know, impacts on wildlife populations. So that's one good reason why we should get rid of them. Um, and I'm just going to, I know it's getting late, but I just wanted to talk about a little bit about vegetation management. Um, and, and I do a lot of work with herbicides, forest herbicides, and I, I, I've heard from a lot of folks who are very concerned about how they impact the environment. And I have a whole presentation on that, but you know, in the interest of time, I just wanted to say one or two things about this whole idea of vegetation management. It's an integrated approach, okay? We can try cultural things first. We can try mechanical means first and biological you know, insects. And chemical is really the last thing we want to have to use. Um, so we always want to try these other things at the bottom of the pyramid first. Okay? And, and I think that's what a lot of we've tried to accomplish. But in some cases, a lot of these species are so aggressive uh, and you know, chemical means make a lot of sense. And, uh, it's worth mentioning that while we can use a lot of mechanical means sometimes, remember that doesn't come without a price either, that when you start using mechanical tools and instruments, people get hurt too. <laughs> and that's you know, one advantage of a lot of uh, forest herbicides. But, so again, this is a pyramid. We want to use items on the bottom first. But in cases, some cases, it pays to go with, um, with these other things as well. And uh, let me just say this, that Controlling a plant depends upon a couple of these things, the species, the abundance, the stage development, the objectives of the landowner, and we want to promote and preserve desirable plants. Okay. That's, that's our goal for the most part. And you got to think about non-native invasive plants as kind of a form of pollution, per se. Um, we want to keep them under control. We want to keep them from spreading onto adjacent properties. And I think that's what you all done here, you know, with all this work that you've done here very responsibly. And there's a lot of techniques out there. And uh, what I've learned over the years is that a lot of these techniques are very uh, focused, are internal. We're not spreading herbicides over large areas. Okay? Uh, foliar is kind of small areas, but a lot of these things, basal bark treatments, we actually apply uh, a solution on the bottom of the tree like this. It chemically gurgles the tree. It doesn't move into the environment. Uh, Pack and squirt is where we take an axe and you go around the tree every three or four inches, you make a frill, you spray in some herbicide, strictly internal in the tree, it doesn't go into the environment. Cut sump or sump injection is the same thing here. Um, sump tree, we cut the stem off at the ground and we apply it to the cut stump. These are all very non invasive techniques that can be used very effectively. Okay? So, there's some guidelines for using herbicides. You want to use the most effective one. Always follow the label. The EPA requires manufacturers to develop these labels. And they put a lot of money into developing the research. Um, so I just, in the interest of time, this is a question that a lot of people have. These things are dangerous, aren't they? Well, the way we measure how, uh, you know, how uh, dangerous, whatever you want to call it, how toxic herbicides are is by the LD50. And that means by tests they do with, um, with, with animals, you know, at what dose would you have to, would they have to ingest in order for 50% of the population to die? It's called the LD50, okay? I put this up just to tell you that when you look at herbicides, okay, and the two main ones that are mainly used, lysophate is what's known as Roundup, by the store, over 5,000 uh, milligrams per kilogram you would have to ingest to kill 50% of the population of rats or something like that. That's an incredible amount of material, okay? It comes out to gallons, you know, that are those quarts. And then trichol here is another one. And the only reason I put these up is just to compare them to other things that we know from our everyday life. So for example, ibuprofen, <laughs> much more, much more toxic. Caffeine, <laughs> you know, uh, Tylenol, and, and I don't mean to uh, downplay this, that these things shouldn't be used 
properly. I'm just saying these things are, are very effective, but they are not very impactful on humans. And the reason for that is that, you know, well, the question is this, how can products with such low acute toxicities be so effective at killing plants? And the reason is that they work at bio, biochemical pathways that are specific to plants. Basically, they interfere with growth hormones and things like that within the plants. You're operating on systems that we don't even have. Now, when you get into insecticides and things like that, where you're hitting something with have, you know, nervous systems, totally different. But for forest herbicides, these are, there's a magnitude of difference. So not to downplay that they shouldn't be used properly, I'm just saying that. You know, they inhibit production of you know, synthesis, you know, amino acids related to growth hormones, systems that we don't even have as humans. So uh, I just say that for what it is. And the other question is, what about the environmental fate of these things? Well, what happens for these, specifically these chemicals that, uh, these, these herbicides that are commonly used, glyphosate, which is again Roundup, and Triclopyr, which is used in a product called Garamon, which you find in some things that we buy levels. The half-life needed for half of the amount to decompose, 45 days for glyphosate, 46 days for trichlopyr. So when they're applied, basically when they hit soil, they're immediately bound up in soil particles. And within a very short period of time, you know, they're, they're basically lost. They're converted to carbon and other types of things. So again, I'm not trying to minimize these things. I just want, in the time I had, just to kind of address these things, uh, to, to kind of say that these things degrade very quickly. And uh, in most cases, you know, runoff is not an issue because they attach themselves to soil particles. We don't use a lot of those chemicals that, that have reaching capability. So with that said, um, I guess the question you have here for Washington Grove is, you know, what is the history you guys are writing on your land? And what I hear from uh, what I've heard tonight, what I've heard from Pat and Joan, is that you have a plan. You kind of know what needs to be done. And I would say the biggest challenge you have, uh, the biggest thing you can do to have a large impact on the ecosystem here is to control the deer at night. And I would just say that uh, if, if you do that, um, you're going to see a large, big, incredible difference in the ecosystems that exact, exist out here. You're going to see more development of layers of vegetation. You're going to see forest regeneration. You're going to see a whole lot more wildlife than you see now. And uh, if you don't believe that, then again, just look at that little explosion, that little 10-foot explosion that's out there, and it speaks for itself. In that little area, all the oaks that, that are in those little places. And uh, you're doing the right thing, controlling the invasives. And uh, you know, if I was making recommendations, I think uh, that's that's what I would suggest. But I think Bill's right. You know, um, there's a lot of uh, opinions when it comes to to deer. Uh, but just remember, by allowing the overabundance of deer, you're allowing the loss of a whole other other groups of wildlife. So I know that it's late, and uh, you guys have been very um, <laughs> patient. But any quick questions or?
that is that is that is the future. So, so planning a drawing was where there. Well, you can go in there and plan it, but again, that's very expensive. You know, when you talk about you got 40 acres and you know, it's very difficult to go out and planting 70, 80 dollar ball and burlap trees in the forest. It's uh, maybe it's better to rely on natural processes, but if that's the only option you have, then that, that certainly is an option. Yeah. Wait, you know, you always notice the questions are always a little limited. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. 